and welcome to Tuesday Training. I hope you're having a fantastic week. As always, we are live from Austin, Texas, right here at Insurance Syndicate headquarters. And man, we have a great show for you. What is happening? Good morning. Good morning. Today is the day. Today is the big day. It's the day you've all been waiting for. Tuesday Training is here today, of course. So welcome. Thanks for coming in, man. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, we are going to kind of do a reboot, a little bit of what we did last week. Uh, got a lot of great engagement on that show. Got a lot of great comments out of it. A lot of people gave me some feedback, said, hey, we really enjoyed that show. We enjoyed, certainly the news updates are great to help keep us informed on what's going on in Medicare. But we like that Q&A stuff that you were doing, right, where you were picking questions uh, that people are asking across the interwebs regarding Medicare, specifically in this case. Um, and, and answering them right there live. So we're going to do some more of that today. Um, but of course, this show is brought to you by my good friends over at DFY CRM. Man, if you are an agent out there looking for a great CRM, I'm telling you, this is definitely the one. 97 bucks a month. You're going to get everything you need in a CRM and you're going to get a whole bunch more. Like it is all that and a bag of chips, automations, nurture workflows, retention workflows. Everything's already built out. All you got to do is plug your assets in. So if you want to check it out, give my buddy Eric and his team a call over at DFY, and uh, they'll get you set up for a demo. Of course, it's AAP time, so like no time to start changing CRMs now. But as you're thinking in the future, right, what do you need? Check out DFY. It's my CRM of choice. I love it. It is outstanding. And man, we got some news for you guys today. Lots of news. Uh, so we're just going to dive right in. Now, it wouldn't be... <laughs> It wouldn't be election day if I didn't at least give you a little bit of that. Not a lot. I promise you I'm not going to make a big political stance here or anything like that. But I do want to point out something that I've been shouting from the rooftops for a while. Um, I posted a different article on my personal page. Oh, maybe it was last week over the weekend. I'm not really sure. Uh, but basically, it's what we've talked about with that emergency. I call it an emergency because that's what it looked like. CMS memo that went out on July 29th that introduced the, uh, the what was it, the premium stabilization demonstration, something to that effect, which was basically their way of trying to correct the giant error that they made uh, in some of the areas of the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, I want to be really clear as I, as I talk about this, because number one, dude, I am all about insulin caps, Right. I got no problem with that. As a matter of fact, Trump actually created the insulin caps long ago at 35 bucks, right? And then all hell broke loose after that with the new administration, whatever. Um, $2,000 cap. Like I have clients that are absolutely benefiting from that. We have a small percentage of clients that are greatly benefiting from those pharmacy caps, right? I have a whole bunch more clients that are spending more money, in some cases, quite a bit more. Right. As an example, I had one lady, an extreme example, and I posted this in the group. She was on a zero dollar value script plan. Well, technically 50 cents. My apologies. It's zero next year. She was on the 50 cent value script plan. Uh, she only has one prescription with some pretty costly eye drops. But WellCare was actually giving her a pretty good deal on it. And eh, not anymore. 2025, the only one of the only plans I could find, and I'm talking standalone Part D plans, because she is a Medigap client of mine, loves that freedom of choice, loves that level of care. She's not looking to move to Medicare Advantage. Uh, but now she has to be on the $89 United Healthcare uh, RX plan. I think it's the preferred RX plan, if I remember correctly. And she still is spending about $1,500 out of pocket for those eye drops. That was the cheapest deal I could get her. So, I mean, there are plenty of people that are getting hosed in this deal. Um, and certainly a good chunk of people, you know, at least a small percentage that are benefiting greatly. I've got another gentleman that was spending about $4,800 a year on drugs. Now he's going to come out of pocket personally, only about $1,400. Because uh, he's taking some pretty heavy duty inhalers. Uh, inhalers are generally quite expensive. So the, the pharmacy cap is going to be great for him. 
outstanding. And again, back to the extreme, I've got other clients that were using the silver script $7 plan as a way to dodge the penalty because maybe they only they either took no drugs or maybe they only took a statin or something to that effect. And now they're, as we know, Aetna got rid of their three drug plans, right? They had the cheap one, the middle one, and the top one, and they just put them all in the middle. So their $7 plans are going to almost $50, depending on the state that they're in. Not a great thing. So what did I do with all those people? Well, I did what was ethical. I moved them over to Wellscript Value Plan, made no commissions on them, at least on the drug side of it. But they're my Medigap clients, and I'm going to take care of them. And I'll go ahead and lead off with this. And this is one of the choices that we've made in our organization, right? I'm not saying what I'm, I'm not going to pretend that what I'm about to say in regards to the drug plans it suits everybody, but it works for us. We are primarily a Medicare Advantage shop, not by choice. I mean, if we had it our way, I guarantee you, you talk to me, you talk to my wife, you talk to our agents, we would really prefer everybody get a Medigap plan with some dental and vision and a decent drug plan to help them out. But we know how it goes, right? A lot of these people choose the zero premium Medicare Advantage plans. And again, it depends on geography. But here's what we came up with in regards to the part the, the the drug plans. We decided to just pretend that all drug plans are non-commissionable, period, right? We know we're going to get a little bit of commission when we enroll a Cigna drug plan. We know we're going to get some commissions on some United Healthcare plans. Some of the higher end Humana plans will make some money on, et cetera. But what we decided was like, hey, we're just going to go ahead and assume that all PDP plans are non-commissionable. And if we happen to enroll somebody in a drug plan that makes us some cheddar, then good, it makes us some cheddar, but we're not going to count towards it. But we came up with a secondary rule. If you want us to work your drug plan and service it, you got to have your Medicare supplement with us. That's the only way it makes sense. Like we're not going to spend time uh, just running drug plan analysis for people to help them out with something simple. We'll coach them up, teach them how to go to Medicare.gov and get it fixed, right? Whatever the case may be. But unless you have your Medigap plan with us, we just can't spend the time servicing your drug plan. But we'll be happy to service your drug plan as long as you got your Medigap with us and we don't care who it's with. The other decision that we made was that we have to remove all PDPs from application count for in-house production points and bonuses. So PDPs no longer count towards your production count if you're in my organization. But good news is other products have good app count and bonuses. So we made some adjustments there. So I know there's other organizations that this is a bigger challenge for. Like you got my buddy over Justin Brock at Bobby Brock, my friends with Boomer Benefits. Like these guys have six figure renewal books of welfare drug scripts that they're getting hosed on. I, I feel for them. So they have to make much tougher decisions. I was in a fortunate spot that we just didn't have enough well care drug business. We're going to use a few grand on it or lose a few grand on it. Not a big deal, right? Because again, most of what we do is MAPD. Uh, anyway, enough of that. This article is pretty simple. It's what I've been saying for a long time that, that apparently they just suck at math because you can't take money away from one side of the equation and not replace it on the other side. So after they created those pharmacy caps, after they created all the additional reporting and things that they're pushing down on the insurance carrier, right? The way they restructured how the, uh, how the drugs are paid for, carriers are having to take a much larger shouldering of the drug expense. Well, premiums went up. And we know that because on July 29th, they released an emergency memo that said, hey, the average bid for Part D plans tripled. It went from, uh, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but roughly around $60 to roughly $180. So what did they do is what this article points out. It says, hey, they came out with an emergency subsidy that is going to crank it up because they don't want everybody to get an October surprise with a tripled drug plan premium right before election day, of course. So it's, it's the way that they're manipulating their voters. I hate it. I've been talking about it for a while and it is what it is, but it says it right here. Democrats were confronted earlier this year with the terrifying reality, a cap on out-of-pocket costs for patients to limit Medicare drug spending passed as part of Biden's signature inflation reduction act was set to spike premiums for millions of seniors. That's all I'm going to say about it. You guys can check this out in the group, but basically it's a $5 billion budget gimmick that just kind of kicked the proverbial can down the road, as it says here. There you go. That's my politics for the day. Let's move on to some basic Medicare. How about some good news? Let's do some good news real quick. Check this out. Uh, this is from oh, Health Leaders, sorry, Health Leaders website and media, whatever. But check this out. It says that a partnership 
I hate this little banner at the top. They won't let me get rid of it. But it says right here that a partnership between Blue Cross Blue Shield of California and Salesforce aims to dilute some prior authorization struggles for providers. This is actually, I'm super excited about this and I hope it works. Because we all know that one of the negatives to Medicare Advantage is prior authorization, right? And, and while it's not as exaggerated, while it's not as big as media and other people like to exaggerate it, if you actually look at the numbers, uh, Kaiser Family Foundation will tell you that 7.4% of claims denials are, is what is happening in the Medicare Advantage space based around prior authorization, right? It's still a lot of people that are getting claims denied. I get it. It's still a problem, right? But if, if they can get a better prior authorization process, we should be able to shrink that number down. And Blue Cross of California is leading the way. So here's what it says here. It says that Blue Cross of California is teaming up with Salesforce to ease the burden of prior authorization for providers. The nonprofit health plan will aim to use its prior authorization platform solution on Salesforce Health Cloud to work within physician systems. The platform will gather relevant clinical data from EHRs, that is electronic health record, right? So it'll gather relevant clinical data from their EHR and disparate systems, allowing members and physicians to get prior authorization when in real time, instantly, right there on the app. After a physician prompt, the platform will search a patient's electronic health record for relevant clinical information and compile an electronic document Physicians will then be able to submit requests from their systems at that moment, and members will receive answers during their medical appointment. Modifications or denials will always be made by a medical director and licensed clinician. Good stuff. And they are going to start testing this platform early next year, hoping that it will actually roll out January of 2026. So it's... It's unfortunate that it takes that long to get something like that in place, but I'm super excited about this. This is something that could definitely streamline claims processing and prior authorization processing for the Medicare Advantage space. I hope what they do is a major success and hope other carriers pick up on it with similar stuff. That could actually be uh, an outstanding deal. Moving right along to some other good news right here from Fierce Healthcare. CMS finalizes a 2.9% pay increase for outpatient facilities with new maternal health mandates. Under a final rule issued by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, hospital outpatient facilities and ambulatory surgical centers will get a 2.9% pay increase from Medicare next year, up from the 2.6% boost in reimbursement floated in the previous draft rule. Calendar year 2025 outpatient prospective payment system and ASC payment systems final rule updates payment rates for hospital outpatient and ASC services by 2.9%. So they're getting a bump. And this, and it says right here, these payment policies affect approximately 3,500 hospitals, approximately 6,100 ambulatory surgery centers. The final rule also includes several provisions to improve, whoops, it's bouncing on me, there it goes, to improve obstetrical services, quality reporting, and care access. CMS updated the conditions of participation for hospitals and critical access hospitals related to obstetrical services. The new maternal care measures set baseline standards for the organization, staffing, and delivery of care within obstetrical units, update the quality assessment and performance improvement program, and require staff training on evidence-based maternal health practices, according to CMS. Looks like good stuff here, right? More money for some of these folks. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a little bit more here. This is a nice one, nice statement. It says, CMS also is requiring facilities to keep basic equipment for treating OB cases readily available for treating OB cases, have written policies for transferring patients and conduct at least one performance improvement project a year, right? And it also says that under the new requirements, obstetrical patient care units must be supervised by a registered nurse, certified midwife, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or doctor of medicine or osteopathy with necessary training. So they're, they're really pushing towards maternal care. Uh, and this increase is going to help them with that as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the director of CMS is quoted here. CMS is committed to addressing 
the nation's maternity care crisis. Today, we are establishing the first ever maternal health and safety standards for hospitals. Additionally, the, the uh, CY 2025 health outpatient or hospital outpatient protective payment systems final rule expands by access to behavioral health services, increases access to certain high cost drugs for those facing cancer in tribal communities and addresses barriers to Medicare coverage for those formerly incarcerated. So pretty good looking stuff here. I'm going to be excited to see more of this rule kind of get fleshed out and open up, but uh, pretty good stuff there. I'm definitely excited to see some increases uh, in reimbursements for some of these folks. So good news there, but unfortunately, doctors instead are getting the shaft. <laughs> right here from Axios, docs to see Medicare cut, Medicare payment cut nearly 3%. And this is specifically addressing doctors get, getting paid under traditional Medicare, original Medicare. This has nothing to do with Medicare Advantage. And if you've ever heard me talk about this specific topic, you have heard me say that for years, if you look at payment reform or Medicare reform, specifically in regards to doctor's payments, you will see a trend that physician payments under original Medicare are downward trajectory. Physician reimbursements and payments under Medicare Advantage is on an upward trajectory, right? There's an incentivized payment structure that exists within the Medicare Advantage products, especially if they're pairing it with value-based care that incentivizes that doctor and rewards him with higher payments. If, again, he can prove that he's improving your health care in an evidence-based way. But under original Medicare, doctors are still getting the shaft. And here we go. It's official. Doctors face another year of pay cuts from Medicare in 2025 under a final rule uh, by, the, by, by the Biden administration on Friday, unless Congress steps in to avert the decrease, right? The big picture right here, physicians will see a 2.9% decrease in their average Medicare payment rates next year, tracking with what the administration proposed back in July. They had actually proposed this back in July. I was kind of shocked that they're getting another one. Because, again, it seems like every year doctors are getting reduction in payments. There's been situations where they've come back with another little rescue bill to delay it, right, or sequester it, right, or just hold it off, kind of kick the can. And they're like, well, we're still going to do it, but we're just going to wait another couple of years or another year or another six months to institute it, right? And then they'll get there and they'll kick it down the can again. So it's likely going to happen again because I'm about to tell you about another bill that's coming right behind this one. But basically, again, starting uh, next year, they're going to see a 2.9% decrease um, in original Medicare provider payments, right? And it says, meanwhile, physician operating costs are going to increase about 3.5% in 2025. So if you kind of look at that math, right, their, their costs are going up 3.5%. Their provider payments are coming down 2.9%. That's basically a 6.4% gap, right? The costs are going up payments going down. So they're going to basically lose 6.4% in, uh, in, in profitability or income, as you might want to say. So there you go. There's that one. So moving on to the next one here, and this is the bill I was just talking about uh, that's coming back around. So they have a bipartisan bill. This is from the American Medical Association that would stabilize those payments for next year. So this happens again. I won't say this happens every year, but these two little ping pongs have been happening often for the last several years where they release one bill that's approved that cuts provider payments. And then they come in right behind it with a new bill to try to be like, Oh, wait a second. Maybe we were a little too hasty before. So this is a bipartisan bill here. And it says to put it bluntly, <laughs> this is a doctor's statement. To put it bluntly, Medicare plans to pay us less while costs go up. You don't have to be an economist to know what an unsustainable trend is, though one has been going on for decades. For physician practices operating on small margins already, this means it is harder to acquire new equipment, harder to retain staff, harder to take on Medicare patients, harder to keep the doors open, doors open particularly in rural and underserved areas. So following right here, what's the news? Following the AMA advocacy in leading the charge to reform Medicare payment system, a bipartisan group in the U.S. House of Representatives has an, introduced a bill that would provide a 4.7% payment update in 2025. This measure would eliminate 
the 2.8% uh, Medicare physician payment cut slated for January 1 and provide a positive payment update that is equal to one half the Medicare economic index. Pretty much. I'm not going to go through that whole article. Uh, it is HR 10073, the Medicare Patient Access and Practice Stabilization Act of 2024. I will say that one more time because that is a mouthful. HR 10073, the Medicare Patient Access and Practice Stabilization Act. Right. So they're coming back behind. And they're trying to reverse the already approved bill that is cutting Medicare physician payments and seeing if they can get it back up closer to what the economic trend is. And hey, man, I'm for it, right? I want the doctors to earn the right amount of money. I'll, I'll just say this. If doctors continue to get payment cuts under original Medicare, then fewer doctors are going to accept new patients on original Medicare. Right. Currently, about 98 percent of doctors, it's down a little bit, used to be able to quote 99. Now you have to say 98, but about 98 percent of doctors nationwide accept Medicare. In most cases, the doctors that don't are usually in the behavioral health category, but that's not a hard and fast rule. But if this stuff keeps happening, if they keep slashing doctor reimbursements under original Medicare, you're going to get fewer doctors. They'll still accept it. They'll probably still take care of their current patients but they're going to quit accepting new patients and trying to grow their Medicare practice if growing it just results in getting reduced payments, right? However, we probably will see more doctors accept Medicare Advantage plans if they start learning that, oh shit, I make more money under the Medicare Advantage uh, payments, especially if I'm uh, able to prove that I have improved your health care in an evidence-based way. I'm going to get bonus payments and so forth. So interesting stuff. Moving along, speaking of payments, uh, another update that Medicare is doing, they are updating a new final rule, uh, implementing changes to a 60-day refund rule. This one's a lot more legal jargon. I'm going to summarize this for you, but I will make sure some of these articles are in the group. Basically, anytime a Medicare Advantage plan or drug plan, right, uh, or anytime I, I should say a provider is overpaid from Medicare, they have 60 days to come back and raise their hand and go, hey, we were overpaid. We need to work on refunding that overpayment to you, right? So they're changing that. And this was part of that physician fee schedule final rule, which by the way, was only 3,000 pages. It was enormous. So now they're, instead of doing 60 days, they are basically, they're going to suspend that and they are going to a 100 day, 180 day investigation to determine, one, if it was really an overpayment, and when did you really learn about what that overpayment is, right? Because that's some of the questions like, well, you have 60 days to refund us, but 60 days from what date? And it was like, well, it was 60 days from the day that you figured out when you were overpaid. And then there's a bunch of gray area on, well, we didn't know we were overpaid here. We thought maybe, you know, it wasn't for another few days before we figured out it was an overpayment, whatever it is. So they're, they're getting rid of that 60 day thing, which is probably good for carriers. I think in some levels and providers, but now they're just going to make it a, a longer, more lengthy, more investigative, more legislative process. Uh, probably going to see more lawsuits if you're going to give them six months to try to negotiate that that refund uh, for the overpayment, prove that it was an overpayment, right? Sue that it's not an overpayment or that it is, and then figure out when and so forth. So pretty interesting there. And then finally, this one, this one kind of hits. Because there's a lot of us out there in the Medicare Advantage world that love veterans. And we love providing give back plans to veterans to help them out, right? One of the great things about Medicare Advantage plans are Medicare Advantage only plans for veterans, right? They are, they have, if they have their VA benefits, they can always go to the VA pharmacy. You can't, I don't think you can even beat, ever beat the prices on a VA pharmacy versus some of the other drug plans and uh, drug coverage that's out there. So a lot of great veterans, if they are enrolled in A and B, because they have to be enrolled in A and B, a Medicare Advantage plan is a great opportunity for them, a Medicare Advantage only plan that doesn't include the drugs, right? Because they're going to go to the VA and get their drugs. But what this does is it allows them to still use the VA clinics. They can still go see the Navy doctor, but now it gives them access to a whole nother network of hospitals, providers, doctors that they can utilize in addition to the VA clinics. Generally, it doesn't cost them any money. And as a matter of fact, a lot of times it includes a Part B give back. 
that will pay them to be on the plan and generally gives them more dental vision and hearing coverage than they would get otherwise. So we sell a good number of these plans. I know there's a bunch out, a bunch of you out there selling these plans, but I get where they're coming from. Federal government may be overpaying veterans health care and Medicare Advantage plans. Medicare Advantage plans receive billions of federal dollars for enrolling veterans who receive no medical services. And what they're saying, no medical services, they're saying, hey, these guys are enrolled in these plans that we're subsidizing, right? Because we know that the federal government subsidizes for every Medicare Advantage enrollee. I'm unsure. I would assume there is, but I'm unsure if there is a difference in the subsidy for an MA only plan versus an MAPD. I would suspect that it's a higher subsidy for MAPD and a lower subsidy for Medicare Advantage, but I don't know that for fact. It's got to be the case, but I've just never seen that in writing. I'm sure that is, though. But nonetheless, the study highlights the growing prevalence of high veteran MA plans defined as plans where 20% or more of enrollees are veterans and their implications for veteran care, suggesting that the federal government is paying for health care twice for an increasing number of veterans, right? So these guys are enrolling in these MA plans. They're taking advantage of the Part B give back, but then they're still just going to the Navy doctor. And they're not actually using the Humana Network or the Aetna Network or the United Healthcare Network, whatever MA only veteran type plan they're on. I kind of understand their beef. So, I mean, I don't want to uh, to speculate that maybe MA only plans will go away. Or maybe they'll figure something else out. I, I'm not sure. But uh, at I can see that as wasteful, potentially wasteful spending. As veterans navigate the increasing complexities of healthcare options, our research aims to inform policymakers, stakeholders about the urgent need to optimize the use of federal resources in veterans care. So it wouldn't surprise me if in the near future we see some, some change on this. But uh, that, that is uh, apparently going to be an issue. So with that said, man, that is the news. And I want to jump into some Q&A. Uh, I, like I've done last week and a couple of other weeks before, um, I have some questions that I picked from some of the different Facebook groups that are out there, people asking questions about Medicare-related stuff. And I'm going to pick through those questions, answer them here right live on the show. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments, man drop them in the comments. And, and and with that said, man, I hope all you guys are having a great AEP that are out there in the Medicare space, right? I should say good morning to all of you to follow what my buddy Dave Williams does. Good morning to everyone except those of you not selling Medicare. All right. So if you're out there in the AEP, man, I hope you're having a kick in AEP. We're killing it over here, right? And as a matter of fact, that reminds me of something I want to address before I jump into these Q&As. There's a lot of people out there. I've seen it in several of the Medicare-related Facebook groups that are whining that the sky has fallen because a lot of these Medicare Advantage carriers, Cigna, Aetna, Humana, Anthem, have all just recently released a whole truckload of plans that are no longer commissionable. And you're like, oh my God, how can they do that? How can they do that? How can they take away our commissions from us on these plans? You, I, I'm going to say that if you're worried about that, largely, like if you think that's a sign uh, that carriers, I'll, I'll look at it two ways. I'll say, number one, if you think that's a sign that carriers are trying to screw you, the agent, your 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 perspective is incorrect. And if you think it's the end of the Medicare space and the Medicare Advantage space for agents, you're also, in my opinion, incorrect, at least in the immediate term. I would say we got at least a solid six years of making, hey, while well, the sun shines in this space before we see some massive pivot. And I'm going to go back to the first part. If you think that the Medicare Advantage carers are targeting you as the agent and they don't appreciate you and they're putting these plans out that offer no commissions, I promise you, you're incorrect. There's a, there's a there's several reasons why these carriers are making these plans non-commissionable. A big part of it is because of the downward pressure that some of the recent, recent legislation has created that is making it tougher on them to remain profitability. You have the, the whole Inflation Reduction Act that makes them pick up more cost and the shouldering of everything. They have to hire more staff to do all the new reporting requirements that CMS is requiring of them. They're having to spend more money to run their program, right? And they're getting, yeah, they're getting a little more subsidy this year, right? Pardon me. 
but they're not getting the same subsidy that they've been getting that helps them grow their footprint and help them manage their uh, adjusted risk score that's every year. This year, they got a smaller bump compared to the risk score. So that's why we're seeing a lot of footprint shrinkage, service area reductions, et cetera. But in regards to these non-commissionable plans, here's a couple of things to look at. Number one, these are plans that are already shitty, most likely. I haven't looked at all of them. I've looked at a few. Most of them that I've looked at are under three stars or three stars or less, maybe three and a half stars. They're all PPOs. If you look at a lot of the counties, they're in areas that are rural, not 100%, but a lot of them are in areas that are a little more rural, right? Or they don't have the health system to really prop up that product. So here's a couple issues. Also, one of the changes was in how they create the star ratings. Star ratings are totally different. There's a bunch of lawsuits going on. United Healthcare, Anthem, I think Humana's involved in it too. There's several carriers that are suing CMS over the, the recreated star rating system uh uh, formula, if you will, right? So if 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 their star ratings drop, they don't get as much money from Medicare. And WellCare is in on it too. They're also suing uh, CMS uh, for, for star ratings issues because a lot of them are saying that, hey, a couple of bad customer service calls that you heard is, is, is you screwing up with our star ratings, which affects our profitability. If our star ratings drop, we don't get as much money, so we can't run these uh, rural PPO plans at the level that we need to, right? We're not able to incentivize the doctors and providers because we're not making enough money. We can't pay for the care that those people need. So there's a couple of things. That's the big part of it, right? Is that they're realizing that while these are going to be unprofitable, shitty plans already based on how everything is shaping up, but they've already committed to rolling them out in 2025. Those contracts have already been signed. So they can't just yank the plan. So they're teeing it up, in my opinion, and I'm pretty sure this is correct, they're teeing it up to phase them out in 2026, barring some other massive change in Medicare in the next year or so. So what they're doing is they're not paying you so that you won't go write any of that crappy plan, and then they will be able to later phase it out. Like one of the carriers openly sent out a letter, I think it was Anthem, that said, hey, we are doing this to discourage people from enrolling in this plan. We do not want people on this plan because it's not going to serve them well. It's not going to help Anthem out. It's not going to help uh, Humana, et cetera, et cetera. So they're not doing this to screw you over as the agent. They're not doing this because the Medicare Advantage sky is falling. Maybe a little, but not much. They're doing it because they're prepping these plans to get phased out in the future. So they're discouraging enrollments. Fair and simple. That's that's my two cents on that one. Now, with that said, let's jump into some Q&A. First one, pretty simple one, right off the top. Does the $35 cap for insulin apply to insulin that is not on the client's formulary? Uh, no. No, it doesn't. It has to be on formulary. Uh, and that includes not only the $35 cap on insulin, but the $2,000 cap in troop. True out-of-pocket cost for prescription drugs, your total out-of-pocket expense, Right. It's only going to apply to drugs that are on formulary, period, end of story. They're not going to give you a $35 cap on a drug that's not on the formulary, just how it is. Straight, straight, simple one there. Moving along, which Medicare Advantage plans have a decent dental benefit? This is going to be certainly plan dependent. It's also going to be geographically dependent or variant, right? Because plans are different in different parts of the U.S. I will tell you that in my experience, uh, Humana tends to have a little fatter benefit on their Humana Dental. Usually you will see them with anywhere from 2 to 3K in comprehensive dental uh, maximum benefit. Uh, Cigna HealthSpring uh, has plans with, I think, I want to say as high as 10. There may even be one couple out there that have a $20,000 dental benefit. I'm of the opinion that that is just bait. Who the hell is using $20,000 in dental? I have bad teeth. And I'm not using 20K in dental every year. So I feel like that one's bait. Maybe it would help if maybe a few people would get involved in that one. I'm not sure. It's pretty limited. Uh, Aetna. Aetna is in some plan. This is going to vary again by plan. But Aetna has more of an indemnity style where you have a PPO option. You can go see any dentist you want, period. 
And then after you pay the bill, you submit a debt and a for reimbursement. Pretty simple indemnity plan. Um, you, I would say, again, in my experience, United Healthcare tends to have the thinnest dental benefits. But again, just look at your summary of benefits, right? Don't, don't try to think, well, I'm only going to sell Humana because they have the largest uh, dental benefit. Again, look at your client. What does your client need? Look at the summary of benefits. Find out what's best. Check the networks in your area, right? Especially if you're if the if the dental product is not necessarily PPO or it might be more strict, right? And if they're doing the Humana plan, it's Humanta Dental Network is what you're looking for. Pretty simple. Um, next one. Oh, I like this one. Am I able to buy your leads from Texas if you're not licensed in that state? So let's, which is a bizarre question. If you're not licensed in Texas, what the hell are you doing generating leads in Texas? But let's just say, for example, because this does happen, like somebody, you get a referral, right? Just happened recently. One of my friends that's in Illinois got a referral from someone in California. They're not licensed in California, so they want to send it to me. Technically, they cannot send that person's info to me themselves without the client's consent. Right. So they have to introduce me and have that client contact me kind of thing. Uh, this is also why I set up. And for those of you that are using or have seen my referral URL that I give to agents, that's why it specifically has all the client consent in there so that they understand what is happening. I am sharing your information with your consent to this agent that I want to refer you to. Right. Pretty simple. So, again, am I able to buy your leads from Texas if you're not licensed in Texas? Not without the client's consent. Period. We are not allowed to share client data. That means name, phone number, address, zip code, like personal detail. Like, like can't share any of that data with another agent without that client's consent. And you better get that consent in writing, in my opinion, whether it be through an email string, a lead form, something. So this is the whole TPMO to TPMO thing that we've that's happened that we know about, right? And it's been doubled down on twice. The FCC's already said leads are now one to one. And then Medicare came out, strengthened it right behind him and said, hey, you're all TPMOs as far as we care, which means one agent cannot share client data with another agent as a lead, referral, et cetera, without that client's consent. So as long as the client's good with it and they know that you're sending their information to me to help refer that business to me, then yes, absolutely. But that's the only condition, right? right? And I know there's a bunch of agents that break that rule. Which it happens every year. I get people that send me that, and I tell them like, "Hey, man, you know, is the client consenting to this? Like, do you have something that says the client's consenting to it? You got to be be smart on that." Moving along, actually, we have a question in the group. Can you talk about buying books of business? What's my feedback? Ooh, that's a tough one, Valeria, because I've never bought a book of business. Um, so I, it, that would be something that I would have limited valid valid information on. Right. I know you can do it. I would tell you from what I've learned about it, you just need to vet the business. What is it? What's coming with it? Is the key agent staying in there? Like, are you buying the agency or are you just buying a book? If you're just buying a book and the key agent is not in there, I would say you're probably, and this is based on what I've been told and talked to from other people that are really good at M&As and buying books. You're probably, if all you're getting is the book and nothing else, you're probably looking somewhere around one and a half, maybe two X. Right. If you're buying a business, an agency is with, with all kinds of bells and whistles and CRMs and the key agent stays in or the customer service team is staying, that's a whole different game. But if all you're doing is buying someone's book of, say, 100 MAs, as an example, you're probably looking at maybe a one and a half, maybe two X tops, in my opinion. But that's that's about all I would have information on that. That is something that you would want to vet a little stronger, maybe even get a consultant involved that can help you with it. All right. Now, there's that one. Here we go. How do you outreach to all of your clients to see that they got their ID cards, their OTC cards, their grocery and their flex cards? So in other words, how do you outreach to all the clients to make sure they got their plan materials that for the plan you wrote them? Um, you call them. That would be the best way. Call them. Right. Uh, number one, what permissions do you have to contact your client? Do you have did you gain permission to text them? Have they are they still opted into emails from you or did they tell you not to email them anymore? And hopefully they never told you not to call them. That would be terrible, right? But ultimately, if you have those permissions, you can reach out to them in any one of those ways. I'll tell you what we do in our office. Pretty simple. Post-enrollment, we're going to touch the client minimum five times in 90 days. As soon as, as soon, we're going to call them after we do the enrollment. I mean, when we do the enrollment, right, we're going to call them. 
pretty simple. And we tell them, hey, as soon as we get your member ID, we're going to follow up with another welcome call, which we do. So as soon as we see the approval from Humana or United Healthcare or whoever it is that has their member ID, we immediately call that client. Hey, Ms. Jones, this is us again. Your member ID for Humana came in. That enrollment's approved. As a reminder, it's going to start January 1st, right? I would grab a pen because I want you to write this down as your member ID. I'm also going to email it and text it to you, but, you know, just so you've got it. Um, in a couple of weeks, maybe 10 to 15 days, you're going to get your materials from the carrier. That'll include your policy, your summary of benefits, uh, the drug formulary, right? A lot of great information on processes. It's also going to include your Humana ID card or your United Healthcare ID card, or your Aetna ID card, your Flex card, grocery card, OTC card, like whatever it comes in that package. We call them and tell them. Now, if they don't pick up the phone, they don't pick up the phone. And that's why email and text are is, is there secondarily. But simply just call them. Now, if you're an individual agent and you've got a thousand clients, that's going to be pretty difficult for you to do. So you need to be hiring some help to do it. So we have a customer service VA that works with us that does that specific job. That is her entire job is to call people, welcome, welcome them to the Avila family. And then about two weeks later, she'll call them again or maybe three weeks. It comes back again. Hey, Miss Jones, it's us. I wanted to make sure. Did you get your materials like we said you would? Cool. Can you grab them real quick? I want to go through a couple of quick items so that you understand how to use them properly. Pretty simple. If they didn't get them on that call, she reschedules it for the next week. Hey, it's me. I wanted to check in again. Did you get your materials yet? Because that, that enrollment's been approved. Oh, perfect. You got them. Do you have them handy? I got a few things I want to go through. If they still haven't gotten them, we'll reschedule it for one more week. If they haven't gotten them by that time, now we're starting to call the carrier and be like, yo, 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 what's going on? Miss Jones materials haven't come in yet. Once we've confirmed that they got their materials, then we call them on day 30, day 60, day 90 to check in on them and make sure like, hey, have you used your plan? Do you like how it's working for you? Have you had any issues when using your plan? Right. And check in on them because we don't pretend we don't pretend that once we sign our clients, oh, they're never going to move. Nobody's ever going to market to them again. Bullshit. And even though you're not supposed to market during OEP, agents find a way to do it. So don't ever think to get so high and mighty on yourself that you think you're such a good agent that people are going to quit calling your clients. They're, your clients are getting bombarded, man. So you've got to be the one that reaches out to them. So understanding that what, if they're an IEP enrollment, they get 90 days after their IEP election to test drive your plan. And just like open enrollment from January to March, it's the same concept, right? So you should be calling those people, I would say, day one, day 15, 30, 60, 90, and touching base with them so that you're in front of them in the event that they have an issue with their plan. That way you can snap fix it and lock in your business and your money. Speaking of, this is goes right in hand in hand. If an agent wrote an app, can you rewrite that app with the same plan during AEP and last app wins? No. No, you cannot. It, that will be kicked back as a duplicate application, right? And when, and, and, when, and when we say same plan, I want to be really clear. That is the exact same plan, not same carrier. Same plan number, H5216-003 or whatever the hell it is. Right. So if you wrote someone Humana Gold Choice, uh, whatever, Humana Choice PPO or something, Gold Choice PPO, 5216-003, and someone else had already written that app, the first app is going to win in that situation. The last app only wins when it's the last unique application. Now, there is a way I, I think you can probably, I've never done this and I probably shouldn't advocate it. But I'm going to do it anyway. Hell with it. Let's say, for example, someone did write him Humana PPO, Humana Gold Choice, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And that person really wants you as the agent of record. Submit a different carrier app. Let it run for about 10 days and then come back and rewrite the Humana Choice. That might work. Not the most ethical thing I probably shouldn't have put out there live, but that would probably be a loophole that would work. Moving along. Let's get the hell off of that one. Uh, on these DSNIP PPO plans. If a client goes out of network, are those out of network costs picked up by their Medicaid benefits? Yes, if that doctor accepts the terms and conditions of that PPO plan and can also bill Medicaid. Right. 
It's just like a normal PPO, right? Everybody, a lot of people un misunderstand PPO plans and think that, oh, I can go, if I have a PPO plan, I can go anywhere. I can go anywhere I want. I have full freedom of choice, just like a Medigap plan. No, no, you don't. You can go anywhere you want on a PPO plan given three conditions. Number one, the doctor accepts Medicare. Number two, he's willing to accept the terms and conditions of your PPO. And number three, he is accepting new patients, assuming you are a new patient. If those three exist, then yeah, go see the doctor. Same thing's going to apply in the decent world. And if you do go see that doctor, you're going to, it's going to be just like you're on a decent HMO. You're going to pay zero. Medicaid's going to pick up those out of network costs for you. So again, before you book the appointment with that new doctor that's out of network, whether you're DSNP or not, you should be advising your client, hey, before you go see that out of network doctor that you've never seen before, get in touch with them and say, hey, doc, number one, do you accept Medicare? Cool. Number two, I'm on the Humana Choice PPO plan. Will you accept the terms and conditions of my PPO plan? Yes. Awesome. And number three, just to double check, are you accepting new patients? Cool. When can I book an appointment? If he says no to any of those, go find another doctor or you're paying 100% of the cost. In this example, you would pay 100% of the out-of-network cost that Medicaid would normally pick up. Moving along, what do you do if you can't get the SOA, the scope of appointment, signed 48 hours prior? I've had multiple seniors tell me they've never heard of this 48-hour thing. And if they don't sign it for an appointment, what do you do? Well, understanding the rules, number one right, of the 48-hour deal. You can only get around it on a couple of exceptions. Number one, it's an inbound call or a walk-in. Then you can scope and present and write immediately. Or if you're in, if I remember correctly, and I forget, it's either the last three days of their enrollment period or the last four days. It's one of those two. And y'all can go double check and verify. It. I'm not going to do it live on the show, It's but it's one of those two. It's either the last three days of their enrollment period you don't have to do 48 hours, or it might be the last four days, but one of those two. Those are the only exceptions. Other than that, 48-hour rule all the time. The key is in how you describe it to them. If you tee it up as a negative, they're going to receive it as a negative. Hey, Miss Jones, I'd love to really show you some plans, but Medicare won't let me show you anything for 48 hours because they think that I'm an asshole and you're probably stupid. So they want to give you a 48-hour cooling off period to make sure I'm not horn swoggling you. If you present it like that, yeah, they're going to be like, what the hell is this dude talking about? And they're probably not going to sign it. And they're probably not going to take the next of appointment with you. So very simple. Here's what we do. And it works great. We don't have this problem ever, right? Number one, be busy or at least pretend that you're busy works. So here's what we do. Someone, we get a lead comes in pretty simple, right? And they're looking to for AEP. They're looking for a plan review. Right. They're on ABC plan. They think it sucks and they want X, Y, Z plan. Right. And they're like, hey, I've got some issues. Right. But this is not an inbound call. This is a lead that we've generated on Facebook or somewhere else. They filled out a form. We called them. Said, oh, OK, cool. You want to. Hey, no problem at all. Tell you what. I have a few questions for you, but I've got them in a simple. And this is where retire flow comes in jamming hot. Retire flow will get you around this bullshit all day long. I promise you, because, again, it's how you frame it. Hey, Ms. Jones, no problem, man. I'm sorry to hear that you're not happy with your plan or that your plan is exiting, right? We work with many clients in your area. We don't represent all the plans. You got to do all that bullshit. But I'm going to send you a quick survey that's going to have everything that I need. It's not invasive. It's just a few simple questions so that I can understand what your healthcare needs are and I can get a head start because my job is going to be to compare your situation across the different products that I represent to find you the right deal for you. So I need some questions and answers. And even if you don't have retire flow, here's how you do it. Oh, no problem. You need help with your plan review? Well, here's the case, right? Here's the first thing. Number one, drugs and doctors are the two primary driving costs of your Medicare Advantage plan. So I need to know up front, what doctors do you have that you can't live without? What prescription drugs are you taking? If you can help me get at least those two bits of information, I can research the plans and find out what's going to suit you well. After those two pieces, I'm going to ask them if they have other benefits that are really important to them. Other than making sure your doctors are covered, other than making sure your scripts are covered, what are the most important things that you need to get on your healthcare plan? Is dental important to you? Is rides to the doctor important to you? Is the food card important? Is the give back plan important? Is any of this stuff important to you? What is it that you want? 
I'm going to collect that information from them. Either I'm going to do it through retire flow or I'm going to do it myself verbally on the phone. And then I'm going to say this, and this is what gets me around this, this statement. Perfect, Miss Jones. I have everything I need. I just need some time to review all the different plans that I offer so that I can come up with some great solutions for you. So if you can give me a little bit of time and then I'm going to pretend that I'm looking for an appointment. I'm not pretending. I actually am. I'm going to look for an appointment on my calendar that's at least 48 hours later from that moment. I'm not going to tell them that, hey, Medicare makes me do this 48-hour thing because I'm a toddler as an agent. I'm going to tell them, hey, now that I have everything I need, Miss Jones, I just need some time to go run through my plans and find the, the right plan for you. Remember, you can't say best. No superlatives. I'm going to go find the right plan for you. Um, looking at my calendar, I have some time as early as next Tuesday. Is morning or afternoon better for you? You sound like a professional. You sound like you're doing your due diligence. And Miss Jones is going to appreciate that. And she is going to be excited to hear from you on Tuesday with the solutions to her problems. That's how you get around the 48-hour rule. Stop making it a problem. Stop presenting it as a negative. And it will be a positive. And you'll be a pro and you'll win the business. Fair enough. Moving on. If you change someone from a UHC PPO to an HMO, will you be the AOR and get paid? Yes, you will get paid. Again, it's plan number. Is the plan number different? I don't care if it's still United Healthcare. I don't care if it's still Humana. I don't care if it's still Devoted, Aetna, whatever. Does the plan number, H5216-003, whatever that number is, is that number different? Then yes, you're going to get paid as AOR. Pretty simple. This is one of my favorite questions. What are the top five or who are the top five to have in your toolbox when it comes to writing Medigap insurance? They don't call me the Medigap mogul for nothing. This is my jam. This is what I've been doing most of my whole career, right? It's been writing Medicare supplements. It's how I cut my teeth in the field. It's how I built my distribution and wholesale. And it's certainly still why most of my clients personally are buying Medigap plans. Um, if you're brand new, and it's going to depend on your geography, where are you at? Number one. Are you selling in one state or multiple states? Like those are some of the questions that I would want to know. Depending on how big your geography is, you should not need more than five. Five would be maximum. I would say you could probably get away with three, maybe four. And here would be my recommendations. And I would say this is true for the most part, regardless of what state you live in. You're always going to need United. You're always going to need United Healthcare. One hundred percent. You got to have that in your bag. Why? Because it's it's the mothership. Everybody's going to ask for it by name, right? And we know it's affiliated with AARP. You're going to have half your clients that hate it, and then you have half your clients that love it for the exact same reason because of AARP's political stances. Doesn't matter. You're going to need that product just as a law, even if it's not the most competitive in your state, you're going to need it as a loss leader because people are going to ask about it and you're going to want to be able to show it to them. And be able to prove to them, yeah, yeah, great brand, great. But if you look at the rates in Texas or if you look at the rates in this state or that state, you can see pretty quick, Miss Jones, they're not that competitive. So I can get you similar benefits at ABC Carrier for, for much cheaper. But you still need them. You also need United Healthcare not only for the brand recognition and the fact that it is the mothership, uh, because they have uh, some tiered underwriting that you can get away with certain cases that you wouldn't be able to write elsewhere. Right. They have level two rates and standard rate and so forth that you can write someone that has AFib or that has cancer or some of these other issues and still get them issued. Right. I had a gentleman that has had prostate cancer, couldn't get them placed anywhere. Got him on United Healthcare, group two rates, no problem, level two rates. And he was happy to pay that four hundred and forty dollar premium for his plan G. Because without it, he had nothing. He was 20 percent coinsurance running around all day. So you need that one. Number one, two. I would generally also recommend Mutual of Omaha for similar reasons, right? Same thing with United Healthcare. They're in every single state. Their footprint is everywhere. Their brand recognition is enormous. And people are going to ask you about it. And it's important that you have it so you can explain it and show it to people. I will also say this. <clears throat> hope Mutual Omaha doesn't terminate my appointment. But I wouldn't write Mutual Omaha unless I was just writing their plan in. I would run, run, run away from their plan F and their plan G unless you hate your clients. Because they have some of the highest rate trends in the business. 
no lie. They used to be only they used to only have bad rate trends on Plan F, and they were really good on G and N. But since Macra and how that changed the dynamic between F and G on who can enroll and who can't, and then now G is having to take on guarantee issue business that is bringing on claims where it used to not, right? Their G block is going up a little higher than it used to in in the old days. But their plan in rates are phenomenal. So if they have a hot plan in in your area, I would definitely pick them up. I would also pick up Mutual Omaha, again, for the brand recognition, the A-plus rating, right? People are going to ask for them. They're going to they're gonna tell you to write them because these are people that are brand aficionados. But then they do have some other products. We write a lot of their cancer product. I believe it's one of the best cancer products out there. So there's other reasons why I like Mutual Omaha as well, but it's not so much for their Medicare supplement portfolio. But I do like their plan in, and I will write the hell out of it if it is valid and competitive in that area. So those would probably be the first two that I chose. Beyond those two, I'm going to be looking for carriers that either A, have some wiggle room in underwriting. For example, Aetna's Medicare supplement does not uh, underwrite based on height and weight. So you can put all of your height and weight irregulars on Aetna with no issues. That's an option. And then I'm going to look for one or two stone cold rate warriors Cheapest rate in my zip codes, cheapest rate in the markets, and not necessarily the cheapest, but like one of the top three to five rates that I can find a strong carrier with, right? I want to find, I don't want to find a piece of shit carrier that just has the cheapest rate, like, like State Mutual many years ago with a C rating that jacked everything up in the industry. I want to find something that's still strong, right? For example, our rate warrior right now is Banker's Fidelity. Love the product. It's a killer They've got great experience. They know what they're doing in the marketplace, right? They're not rookies at this. They have an excellent rating, great loss ratios. So like that's my rate warrior that I'm running with. ACE Medicare Supplement is another strong rate warrior in a lot of areas. So right, so I'm going to get one or two flagships and I'm going to get one or two rate warriors. And then I'm going to try to find one, maybe two at most, but probably one carrier that gives me some underwriting wiggle room so that I have, you know, people that aren't as healthy as others. I can still find a place to put them. Now, of those five carriers, my two flagships are going to stay constant. I'm always going to have United Healthcare. I'm always going to have Mutual Omaha. But the other ones, they might rotate every two to three or four years, right? Where maybe their rates mature and I need to go find a new rate warrior, right? Or maybe their underwriting tightens up and I need to go find another company with wiggle room. Pretty simple. Moving along, we'll get this wrapped up. Got a couple more minutes. If a client switches plans, is there a look back on past plans where they will not pay for certain procedures? No. No, there's not. And this person's asking this question in regards to Medicare Advantage plans. And no, there's not, right? 100%. There's no pre existing clauses, nothing of that exists. It's also true in Medicare supplements if you had major medical insurance within the last 63 days, whether it was group insurance, another Medicare supplement or a Medicare Advantage, right? But if you've had no health coverage in the last 63 days and you enroll in a Medicare supplement, then yes, many of them can give you a six month waiting period for pre-existing. It doesn't always get enforced, but it's out there. All right, last one. Is diabetes an automatic denial for MedSup plans across all carriers? No, no, it is not. Again, this is what I was just talking about. You need some products that give you some wiggle room. Diet, there are some carriers, like I, I want to say, if I'm going a little bit by memory, uh, but Trans, uh, Trans Amendment, I mean, Trans America, uh, they had a product that was like no diabetics, period, end of story. They don't care. Diabetic, you're out. Some of them, they're like, oh, it's okay to be diabetic, but you can't be taking insulin. If you're an insulin-dependent diabetic, we won't take you. But if you're just taking metformin or whatever, no problem at all. Others will say, we're good with diabetics as long as you're not also taking drugs for hypertension or for heart disease or stroke, right? Or, or congestive heart failure. Like if you have that comorbid, they'll be like, no, 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 no. We're not taking that one. Others will say, uh, we got no problem with diabetics, even if you're taking insulin, even if you're taking hypertension drugs, but as long as you're not taking more than 50 units of insulin and there's been no change in your hypertension meds for at least two years. Other ones will go all the way up to 200 units. So it, that is definitely not an absolute space. That is where getting good at field underwriting and learning your products is going to help you out because not everybody is just a straight decline on diabetes. If someone's a diabetic and you're trying to find a Medicare supplement for them, there are plenty of options. Trust me, you just got to get 
you know, a little, a little knowledgeable about underwriting. Uh, and then I'll say this, if you write a lot of Medicare supplements or final expense, I would highly recommend you check out insurance toolkits from Joe Wall. Great product. Dude, it's, it's inexpensive. You can snag it and you can send all your underwriting cases to it. And it will tell you which carriers will most likely take that case and rank them with the rates and everything. So there you go. So there's Tuesday training, man. The time is up. I'm actually one minute over. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Thank you so much. I hope you all have a productive day. And I'm, I'm going to give you one last thing. I know we're all uh, ramped up and excited and distracted today because it's the big day, right? It's the big day. Turn off the news. Turn off your cell phones and pour your head in your work and just bust your ass today and go make yourself a bunch of money. Have an awesome day. We'll see you next time on Tuesday training.